The movie Unbroken tells a true story of Louis Zamperini, who died a few years ago, and whose life story is also told in a book of the same name. Zamperini was an Olympic runner from California who was called into serving on a bomber crew in the Pacific in World War II. His plane was shot down over the Pacific, and he and two other survivors drifted over 40 days living on rainwater and the occasional fish or bird they could catch. Unfortunately, one of the crash survivors died on the raft. But Zamperini and the other survivor, the plane's pilot, were finally nearing land when they were captured by the Japanese Navy. The Japanese did not inform the U.S. of the capture of Zamperini, and after some time, he was declared officially dead by the Americans. But his family in California refused to give up hope that he might return alive. Zamperini was sent to a series of prisoner camps, eventually arriving at a camp in Tokyo where he received particularly brutal treatment from a guard the man called the bird. When the Japanese surrendered, Zamperini was sent back to the U.S., and this is where the movie ends. What the movie doesn't show is the rest of Zamperini's life. After he got home, Zamperini had constant nightmares. He was disturbed by flashbacks to his days as a prisoner and had terrible dreams of being beaten by the bird and dreaming about wanting to strangle his former captors. And so he began to drink heavily, trying to forget his experience as a prisoner of war. His personal life fell apart, and his wife wanted to divorce him. In 1949, at the encouragement of his wife and her Christian friends, Zamperini reluctantly agreed to attend the Billy Graham crusade. Reminded by Graham's preaching of his prayers during his time on the life raft and imprisonment, Zamperini recommitted his life to Christ. Following this, he forgave his captors, and his nightmares began to cease. He even found it possible to forgive the bird for his brutality. Billy Graham helped Zamperini launch a new career as a Christian speaker. And one of the recurring themes in his talks was forgiveness. And he visited many of the guards from his POW days to let them know that he had forgiven them. This included an October 1950 visit to Sumagao Prison in Tokyo, where many war criminals were imprisoned, in which Zamperini embraced those who stepped forward to acknowledge that they recognized him and express forgiveness to them. Zamperini was told that some of them became Christians in response to his forgiveness. My friends, while your life story may not be as dramatic as this, there will come a time in your life when you will come to a crossroad, and in that spiritual moment or existential crisis, you have to make a decision. How should I be living my life? You may realize that the life you are living and have lived isn't purposeful. It isn't satisfying. It makes you feel very guilty, and you and I need to change. It is what we call a spiritual awakening. And as we continue our study in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis in our sermon series titled, When Giants Walk the Earth, we want to take a look at four spiritual principles, four truths that should spiritually wake us up and wake up this generation to live changed lives for the Lord. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 5 as we go from chapter 5 verse 1 to chapter 6 verse 8. Genesis chapter 5 verse 1 to chapter 6, verse 8. I read now verses 1 to 20 of Genesis chapter 5. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. So all the days that Adam lived were 930 years, and he died. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years, and he had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Canaan. After he begot Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Canaan lived 70 years and begot Mahalalel. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, 
Mahalala lived 830 years and its sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalala were 895 years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Jared were 962 years and he died. Now, why did I just take time to read through these verses that we often tend to skip over? And if we do read these verses, our focus is on how long everyone lived and nothing else. Because it's very difficult for us to imagine that someone lived almost a thousand years back then when it's already unimaginable to live to a hundred years old today. For example, someone who's a hundred years old today would have been alive during the Great Depression or when radios was considered new technology and not readily available in homes. While somebody who is a thousand years old today would have been alive when the Byzantine Empire was still in existence or when the Song Dynasty ruled China. Now, we may wonder why the Bible would record in detail the ages of these individuals, including the age of when they had certain children. But it certainly points to the accuracy of the Scriptures that God would care about such details. I've been asked why people pre-flood lived for such a long time and were able to have children at much older ages. While we don't know for certain, perhaps the pre-flood conditions were such that it allowed for people to live longer or the terrible effects of God's curse on earth had not fully taken effect. Just like we previously mentioned, that in the early centuries of mankind, genetic mutations and abnormalities due to sin entering the world was minimized and only got worse as time marched on. Whatever the case, after the flood, human lifespans began to greatly lessen. However, regardless of the long lengths of life each of these individuals lived, I want to point out that the Bible makes it very clear that each one of them died. And the phrase, and he died, is repeated for each of these men. This is the effect of sin, that each person would die, which is what God warned Adam and Eve would happen when they disobeyed him and didn't trust him and ate of the forbidden fruit. It doesn't matter if it was Adam or the godly Seth, all died. I point this out because it is a reminder for all of us that we will meet the same fate one day and we will all physically die unless the rapture occurs before we die. Of course, we don't dwell on when we will die because our time on earth is determined by God and we certainly shouldn't wake up every morning thinking, I may die today. That would certainly be morbid and a depressing thought. However, I think this is something that many of us, especially those who are younger, need to keep in mind because Recognizing this reality will cause us to live our lives very differently. And so the first biblical truth I want us to remember, which should spark a spiritual awakening in your life, is this. Biblical truth number one, every one of us will die. Are you ready when the time comes? Every one of us will die. Are you ready when the time comes? Whether that death comes expectedly or unexpectedly, will you be ready when the time comes? Think about your life's perspective and how it completely changes from one day to another. When, for example, your doctor tells you that you've been diagnosed with stage 3 or stage 4 cancer, or that the disease you have is terminal and incurable, how would your life change? For many, they would begin to prepare so that perhaps their will is up to date. They would give instructions for various wishes they have for their family. They would even try to restore perhaps broken relationships or no longer worry about petty fights and disagreements. People who know their time on earth is short may even quit their jobs because it's unfulfilling. They may begin to travel the world or enjoy what they put off doing for a long time. They usually would be nicer to people, and people would certainly be nicer to them. They will mature very quickly and begin to think about future things rather than dwell on what is temporary, like what is for dinner tonight. The knowledge of impending death does change us, as well as it should, because the life we live on earth reverberates throughout eternity. The decisions we make today about accepting or rejecting Christ will determine our eternal destinies, and the faithful work we do for Him will determine our eternal rewards. But that's for those who know their time on earth is short. What about those who die suddenly? The family is unprepared 
and the person who's involved, perhaps in a fatal accident or suffers a catastrophic medical condition that immediately takes their lives, would certainly not have time to prepare. Knowing that we're all going to die, but not knowing when should wake us up to the realities of our frail, temporary, and mortal life. So the question is, are we readying ourselves for when that time comes for us to leave this earth? As I continue to age, and now in the fourth decade of my life, I'm well aware of the realities of my future possible health challenges. You see, all four of my grandparents died from some form of cancer, and my mom and extended family members have or are battling cancer. So it's something I'm well aware of, of which I need to watch out for, as it's part of my genetic makeup. But I don't dwell on it every day, because I know my life is secure in God's hand. However, practically, it is something I prepare for as God would want. In fact, because I also travel often, Cindy knows where to access a spreadsheet, which has all the important information she will need in case the plane I'm on ever crashes. I prepared that spreadsheet because I'm not taking anything with me when I meet the Lord and because I love my family and want an easy transition for my wife and children when the time comes. In fact, that's why Christians should be the most prepared for their earthly departure because they should not be afraid to talk about death or have any superstitious notion that by even mentioning death, it brings bad luck or quickens the date of our departure. My friends, the date of our departure from this earth is in the hands of God, and we will not be leaving a second earlier or a second later than what God determines it. So we can certainly prepare and plan. Christians of any age who know that life is short and temporary should be the most prepared for their departure from this earth and should live their lives accordingly in preparation to meet the Lord. So I recognize this truth that I will die. It changes how I live, but I don't dwell on it because I don't have an unbiblical or unhealthy fascination with death. But this truth should serve as a wake-up call for all, especially those who are younger thinking they have years and decades ahead of them before they should begin to think about the serious things of life. Be prepared now. I've done funerals for individuals of all ages, including those who are in their teens. Are you ready to face death when the time comes, whether with advance notice or without any notice? My friends, I pray you've already placed your trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, because if not, you should not be able to sleep every night Worried you will spend eternity in hell, a place deserved for all who have committed even one sin and do not have that sin forgiven through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. I read now verses 21 to 24. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Here we see in verses 21 to 24, a departure from the formula of how the genealogy had been presented when it said of Enoch, he walked with God. Apparently, Enoch did not walk with God for the first 65 years of his life. He probably lived in the same manner as the people of his time, which was a life of sin. But there was a life-changing event in his life that sparked a spiritual awakening for him and it was the birth of his first child, Methuselah, and Enoch became a father. Apparently, the birth of his first son struck within Enoch a deep, intense sense of responsibility for that child. It was then that he made a commitment to walk with God. Note carefully what the Bible says. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked with God. Why would the birth of a child elicit such a spiritual response? Well, as any father or parent knows or should know, there is an enormous responsibility being a parent and raising a child. It's been said that nothing matures a husband like the birth of his first child. Becoming a parent carries with it great responsibilities, and it can be overwhelming. You are now responsible for another life. You are responsible to provide for the physical needs of your child, including providing food and housing. You are now responsible to provide for the intellectual development of that child, which includes paying for schooling, books, and supplies. 
But don't forget, you are also responsible for providing for your child's spiritual needs. Perhaps Enoch suddenly realized that if I'm going to raise my son to be a good and godly person, then I have to model it as well in my life. And this begins with me having a personal walk with God. You know, the Bible doesn't have a lot of verses which talks about how a parent is supposed to raise their children. Other than a handful of verses about discipline and parent-to-children interaction, there simply aren't many verses on how to raise our children spiritually, which you may think is quite surprising. However, there are many verses on how we, the adult, the parent, is to live and act in a godly manner. I believe the Bible is teaching us that the best way to raise our children is to be a good and godly model for what we want our children to be. And I think we all desire that, good and godly children. But we have to model it for them. If we don't want our children to pick up bad habits or engage in sinful vices, then we better not practice those things as well. The old adage of do as I say, not as I do, simply doesn't work, especially in this generation Because the child will see in us a big hypocrite and simply ignore what we say. Model Christ-likeness and godliness to your children, and they will see how it is lived out, and they will emulate it. It will also give you the moral ascendancy to discipline your children and for you to tell them how to act rightly. Yes, children are to respect and obey their parents, but those parents need to be people worth respecting and obeying as we live out what we desire for our children. I know I've told this story before, but it makes my point clearly. More than a decade ago, I was in my office on a Sunday morning, and I heard a commotion outside my office near the baptistry. It was a mother and child having a heated argument. I listened in and realized the child was refusing to go into a Sunday school classroom. The mom said, you need to go in right now. And the child said, no. Then the mom said to the child, if you don't go in, you're going to get punished. At this point, the child was crying and was very angry and shouted to his mom in a loud voice, heard by many who were heading up to the sanctuary for the worship service, these words. Why should I attend Sunday school when you and dad don't even attend the adult worship services? Why are you making me do something that you don't even do? There was silence, and all those around got really silent. I think they were trying to pretend not to be listening in, but you know they were intently waiting for the mom's reply. But the mom had no reply and simply said, okay, let's go home. The parent had lost. She didn't have the moral authority to tell her child to do something she and her husband were not even doing themselves. May this be a reminder to all of us. Look back at verse 22. The Bible tells us Enoch was so dedicated and committed in his walk with the Lord that it lasted for more than 300 years without wavering. This is a type of walk with God that wasn't all talk, but lived out in action, a genuine commitment to live his life for the Lord. In fact, he walked so closely with God that God simply took him home to heaven without Enoch dying physically. We see the special blessing for Enoch mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. The Bible tells us Enoch simply disappeared from the earth because God took him to glory. I love the last phrase of this verse, where it said that God was pleased with him. That means more than being committed to walking with the Lord, Enoch did everything he could to please God with his life. You see, my friends, there's a difference between walking with God and pleasing God. Many people claim to walk with God. They walk with him for five minutes of their lives, and they would say they walked with God. They come and go to God as it fits their liking, and when they assess their lives, they would say generally they walked with God. But to live a life whose desire it is to please God is a higher level of commitment. Everything about your life is doing things that pleases the Lord. You no longer serve as you please, but you serve and live this life at His pleasure. Can it be said of your life when assessed, he or she 
was one who pleased God because this is what was said of Enoch. As a reward for this type of life, Enoch was one of only two people in the Bible who never died physically, the other being Elijah. God simply took them straight to heaven. And Enoch is commended once more in the Bible in the book of Jude, chapter 1, verse 14. Jude 1, 14. Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men. See, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones to judge everyone and to convict all of them of all the ungodly acts they have committed in their ungodliness and of all the defiant words ungodly sinners have spoken against him. It's only natural that when one walks with God and lives a life of desiring to please God, that he will want to share with others about his walk with God and what God says in his word about how one should live. And so Enoch spoke truth to the sinful people of his generation. The message that Enoch shared certainly would not be a popular message, which probably didn't make him very popular. But then again, when you are living your life for God's pleasure, you don't care what others really think about you. Your life is not about getting people to like you. While unpopular, it was a message that his world needed to hear. And here is what is important to know. Enoch can speak the truth of God's judgment on their ungodliness without sounding like a hypocrite. Because as the writer of Hebrews tells us, everyone in this time knew he was one who walked the talk. Enoch walked the talk so he could talk. He walked the talk so he could talk. Do you walk the talk so you can talk? Enoch pleased God with his life. So he had the spiritual authority and moral ascendancy to talk and warn of God's impending judgment to the people of his generation. When you tell others about repenting, do you live a repentant life? When you talk about forgiving others, do you live a life of forgiveness? When you talk about love, do you live a life of love? When you talk about grace, do you live a life of grace? The life of Enoch points us to another biblical truth, Biblical truth number two, which has spark a spiritual awakening in your life, and it is this. Your walk with God and how you desire to live for Him are what is most important. Your walk with God and how you desire to live for Him are what is most important. My friends, an intimate walk with God and your desire to live for Him will change your approach to this life. It will lead to a spiritual awakening of what is important in your life and what is unimportant. And what is unimportant are the temporary allures of this world. A walk with God leads to life, as we clearly see in the life of Enoch. A walk with the world leads to death. Now look with me at verses 25 to 32 of Genesis chapter 5. Methuselah lived 187 years, and he begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Lamech lived 182 years and had a son. And he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. After he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years, and he died. And Noah was 500 years old, and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Again, other than Enoch, each of these men died at the end of their long lives because of the effect of sin. However, in this chapter full of death, we also see great hope. Because the life of Enoch illustrated that those who walk with God would escape the curse of death. Just like today, when we place our trust in the death of Jesus Christ... It is indicative of our desire to walk with God. Then we can also escape the curse of spiritual death, but instead gain the hope of eternal life. But there's another glimmer of hope in this chapter of many deaths. As Noah was born to Lamech, who had high hopes for his son. His hope was that his son would somehow serve to comfort those who were under the curse. Little did he know that God would use Noah to save the human race, because Noah, like Enoch, also walked with God and lived for him. You see, my friends, 
wake up now and realize that the most important thing in your life is to walk with God and how you live for Him. May this realization prompt you to have a spiritual awakening and change how you live. I read now verses 1 to 3 of Genesis chapter 6. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Admittedly, verses 1 to 4 are some of the toughest verses in all the Bible to exposit and explain because of the lack of information we are given. But these verses do point to one thing, that the earth was becoming more sinful and wicked, and death was the consequence. Now, don't lose sight of this emphasis of these verses as we try to answer some of the questions you may have about what has been written. The question that is often asked is, who are the sons of God, and how is it that by procreating with the daughters of men did their children become giants, Nephilim, mighty men and men of renown. Let's take a look first at the question of who are these sons of God. Now, some have suggested that these sons of God were fallen angels who procreated with human women because in Hebrew, the term sons of God referred to angels when used in the Old Testament. However, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 30, it tells us that angels in heaven do not reproduce. Perhaps this is an exceptional case that God allowed, or Matthew 22.30 isn't referring to demons, only to angels. Because in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 4-5, to five, it talks about a very grave sin that certain fallen angels committed that caused them to be confined in the bottomless pit, unable to freely roam the earth as other demons do. Also, Jude 6 and 7 point to certain fallen angels who, quote-unquote, did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode, and they are also held in the abyss. Some have suggested that the demons did this because they wanted to pollute the human bloodline in order to prevent the coming of the Messiah. However, this is just conjecture because the Bible simply doesn't speak of this. The view that the sons of God are fallen angels assumes that all three books, Genesis, 2 Peter, and Jude, refer to the same event. Now, others have suggested that the sons of God were from the godly line of Seth, who married ungodly women from the line of Cain, as the Old Testament sometimes refers to the godly as God's son. However, this would be an exceptional, unique use of the technical Hebrew phrase, which refers to angels. I've wavered in my personal position regarding how to identify these sons of God. And frankly, it really doesn't matter and doesn't affect any of the theological positions we hold to. I've come to the conclusion that we simply won't know for sure who the sons of God are who marry these daughters of men because God didn't reveal it to us. His emphasis was on the increasing wickedness of mankind during this time. But we can say for certain that these fallen angels or wicked men, perhaps demonically influenced or possessed, married these beautiful women because they lusted after them, as verse 2 tells us they saw that these women were outwardly very beautiful. The sinful fallen world had become very fleshly, focusing only on the outward beauty, rejecting anything as it related to godly character and inner beauty. And because of this increasing wickedness, God's judgment would come upon man in 120 years with the great flood. The 120 years referenced in verse 3 doesn't mean that man would only live to 120 years old as we see that even after the flood, people live longer than 120 years, although the human lifespan began to get shorter and shorter. God's judgment would come upon the wicked world. Look at verse 4. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. In verse 4, we're told that the union of these sons of God and daughters of men produced the Nephilim, literally translated fallen ones or giants. And they're also referred to as mighty men and men of renown. Some have suggested that the sons of God had to be demonic because only the mixture of angelic DNA mixed with human DNA 
could produce these giants. However, that's simply fanciful thinking. There are many average-sized couples who give birth to very tall people, more than seven or eight foot tall. In fact, the term giants is a non-technical term. Individuals who are substantially taller than me would be considered a giant in my books. If I visited an NBA locker room today, I would think I was standing amongst giants. So giants are simply those who were taller than the average height of those living at that time. The Bible tells us correctly that they lived before and after the great flood as well. You see, the spies of Israel, before they entered the promised land, thought they saw the descendants of the Nephilim when they encountered very tall Canaanites who towered over them. David killed the giant Goliath, who had other siblings who were also very tall. The Bible records that the Israelites killed the giants that lived in the land in their conquest. And in the modern day, we have sports stars like the wrestler Andre the Giant, who is over seven foot tall and more than 500 pounds, or NBA stars like Shaquille O'Neal or Yao Ming, well over seven foot tall, all who could be considered giants. So giants or really tall people have been around for a very long time and really shouldn't be shocking to us. However, at that time, the Nephilim were awe-inspiring as they were very tall humans who towered over many and were able to do great things and thus were very famous, men of renown. They were ancient celebrities and they were probably admired for their towering presence and their ability to do many things ordinary people were unable to do. But sadly, most all of their acts were evil and did not honor the Lord. Because what impressed mankind did not impress the Lord. Let me repeat that. What impresses man does not impress the Lord. Look at verses 5 and 6 at the commentary for how God viewed the people of that generation, even if they were famous and popular. I read now verses 5 and 6. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. Instead of being impressed by man, Nephilim or not, God was grieved and greatly saddened by the sinfulness of man. Mankind lived in wickedness. They lived in the flesh And they didn't desire any relationship with the living God who created them. In fact, we see that in their hearts. The people's motive and purpose was only to do evil. Matthew 24, 38, in describing the people of that generation, tells us that all they did was party and live out human debauchery and depravity. And the Lord was very sad. That the very people He created cared nothing for Him, cared not to be in relationship with Him, And it absolutely broke his heart. My friends, I want you to understand this third truth. Biblical truth number three, which would spark a spiritual awakening in your life. And it is this. Sin and wickedness grieves the heart of God and hurts him deeply. Sin and wickedness grieves the heart of God and hurts him deeply. I think many of us have forgotten the pain we bring to God's heart when we sin. And that's why we continue to do it. But if we knew that God's heart is broken when we engage in any type of sin and wickedness, then maybe we would consider living in holiness as opposed to wickedness and sin. Just imagine if you have the audacity and the cold stone heart to go up to your mother, the one who bore you and raised you and told her to her face, I hate you. I do not care about you. I want nothing to do with you. You mean nothing to me. You haven't done anything good for me. And everything you tell me to do, I'm just going to do the opposite. Would there be any child so heartless as to do that to his or her mother? If I heard a child telling his mother that, I would be so upset and angry because I could never do that to my own mother. But for sure, that mother's heart would be devastated and broken. If we saw a child say that to his mother, we would want to comfort that mom because she would be in so much pain. But that's exactly what we do to our Heavenly Father when we sin and live in wickedness. We are telling God, you mean nothing to me. I don't care about you. 
I'm going to do the opposite of what you have told me to do. And God's heart is broken. The sins of His children grieve Him deeply. My friends, if you don't want to break the heart of God, who has given us so much love, care, grace, and mercy, then live a life of holiness. This truth should be a spiritual awakening for how we are to live and act. For we know sin grieves the heart of God. We should hate sin even more because we love God so much. When we know sin grieves the heart of God, we should hate sin even more because we love God so much. Is that how you live your life? Amy Imbo shared in her blog this experience. Have you ever had to deal with deep sin with one of your kids? I'm not talking about the kind of sin like stealing a cookie from the cookie jar. I'm talking about sin that must be dealt with immediately or else it will hold them in serious bondage for a long time. A trap that drags a person down deeper once caught. One of my kids stumbled into a specific sin by accident. Upon my discovery of the sin, this child began forming a web of lies in order to try and hide the sin. I wanted so much to believe my child, but I knew something about the entire situation was not quite right. After more prompting and asking, my child finally confessed. The realization of the depth of this sin shattered my heart. All I could do was crawl up my stairs to my bedroom where I crumpled onto the floor weeping. All I could cry out was, Oh God, please help. That's it. I could not form any other words. But now... I don't know how long I was on the floor sobbing, but finally my husband came upstairs to talk with me about what we would do. I was still in a state of unbelief and shock. How could this happen to my child in our family? I thought I'd prepared them well enough. My husband and I talked about our plan of action. What now? There had to be some form of discipline for the original sin and for the lies. But we also wanted our child to understand that there was a way out that my child was not condemned in this sin. There was redemption and restoration through Jesus Christ. We had to lead our child to the cross of Christ and teach our child how to deal with this sin. My husband shared with our child his own struggle with similar sin in his past and what he did to overcome the sin. We wanted our child to know that they weren't the first person to ever fall prey to this sin. I did not want a cloak of guilt and shame placed on my child's shoulders. I did not want to come off as the perfect person who was without sin. I wanted my child to understand that we all struggle with sin, all of us, including mommy and daddy. Through this circumstance, a new hatred for sin developed in my heart. I had a deeper understanding of what God may feel like when He watches His children fall into sin, how it must break His heart how it must grieve Him, especially when we try to hide it from Him. The brokenness I felt that day was just an inkling of what He must feel when I sin. I gained a new perspective on sin, and I wanted even more to live a life that glorified God. I wanted to be sure to turn from sin every single time. I can't say I've always been successful with this. I'm still human after all. But the new perspective has helped me to turn away more often than ever before. If you know, my friends, that sin breaks the heart of God, will you hate sin even more because you love God so much and desire to live for Him? If you know that sin breaks the heart of God, will you and I hate sin even more because you and I love God so much? That would certainly be a spiritual awakening in our lives. Look at me now at verses 7 and 8. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because the holy God is grieved by man's sin, he would take action, and his action is to enact his just punishment by wiping man and beast from the face of the earth. Now, if you think that God is unfair in doing this, Remember that God has been waiting patiently for many generations for man to shape up and live in righteousness. Mankind deserve this punishment. They have done nothing to deserve God's continued blessings 
and he would take those blessings away. Those who have walked with him like Enoch, God had blessed. And then we have that conjunction, but in verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God would withhold his rightful punishment of mankind and completely destroy them because of a single man named Noah who found grace, undeserved favor in God's eyes. And as we will see in subsequent weeks, because of God's grace, mankind will continue to exist because of Noah, again, specifically because of God's grace. This is the first time the word grace is found in the Bible, even though it has been seen in God's previous actions. And here we can draw out our fourth biblical truth that should spark a spiritual awakening in your life. Biblical truth number four, God's grace is the only hope for mankind. God's grace is the only hope for mankind. And it was because of God's grace that he would send his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and me, to provide a way of salvation to people who deserved eternal death, but instead received eternal life. It is because of God's grace that we are blessed when we deserve so much worse because of our sinful actions. Grace is the only hope for mankind because if we got what we really deserved, life would be terrible and horrible for us. So my friends, wake up and realize you and I are not entitled to anything. It is because of God's grace that we have what we have and in return should live lives of thankfulness and appreciation. We should live our lives for Him. Don't take advantage of God's grace to live a sinful life. Desire to live a holy life because of God's grace. Maybe this story will help you understand my point. On the first day teaching his class of 250 college freshmen, R.C. Sproul carefully explained the assignment of three term papers. Each paper was due the last day of September, October, and November Sproul clearly stated there would be no extensions except for medical reasons. At the end of September, 225 students dutifully turned in their papers, while 25 remorseful students quaked in fear. We're so sorry, they said. We didn't make the proper adjustment from high school to college life, but we promised to do better next time. He bowed to their pleas of mercy, gave them an extension, but warned them not to be late next month. The end of October rolled around, and 200 students turned in their papers while 50 students showed up empty-handed. Oh, please, they begged. It was homecoming weekend, and we ran out of time. Sproul relented once more, but warned them, this is it. No excuses next time. You will get an F. The end of November came, and only 100 students turned in their papers. The rest casually told Sproul, don't worry about it, Doc. We'll get it in soon. Sorry, Sproul replied. It's too late now. You get an F. The students howled in protest. That's not fair. Okay, Sproul replied once more. You want justice, do you? Here's what's just. You'll get an F for all three papers that were late. That's the rule, right? The students had quickly taken my mercy and grace for granted, Sproul later reflected. They assumed it. When justice suddenly fell, they were unprepared for it. It came as a shock, and they were outraged. Don't take advantage of God's grace to live a sinful life. Desire to live a holy life because of God's grace. Sadly, the generation today looks very much like the generation described in Genesis chapters 5 and 6. And so those of us who know Christ should really live very differently. And it all begins with our own spiritual awakening. May these truths wake us up for how we should live. Remember, number one, every one of us will die. Are you ready when the time comes? Number two, your walk with God and how you desire to live for Him are what is most important in life. Number three, sin and wickedness grieves the heart of God and hurts Him deeply. Number four, God's grace is the only hope for mankind. My friends, let us live our lives like Enoch of old, who walked with God so closely and faithfully that there were no regrets, only blessings, when our time on earth is done. Let us live Christ-like lives because of God's grace, knowing that sin breaks the heart of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that every person 
who listens to this message will undergo a spiritual awakening, that they will examine how they've lived their lives, and with the realization of these truths, live their lives for you, holy and pleasing, knowing that your grace is so abundant in our lives that we do not desire to break your heart. Father, I pray that every one of us will understand that our walk with you and how we desire to live for you should be the most important thing in our life so that when our time on earth is done, we will be ready to meet our Savior and Lord. Father, bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you.